This. Okay. Um, go for it. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Olson, and this talk is uh, titled "Introducing System R." Uh, it is about um, a uh, lambda calculus system implemented in Rust that uh, I had implemented and am sharing. And uh, this talk is, you know, describing it. Uh, it's also an introduction to lambda calculus. The first section um, will be mostly like slideshow format, while we uh, look over the lambda cube and just. Kind Kind of as a concept and analogy and use it to uh, explore some language features and introduce the syntax. Are you guys hearing anything? Uh, oh, can, 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 everybody, can everybody hear us? Let me... Okay, I can hear you, but I, I can't hear the microphone from the front of the room. I thought... Is it, is it coming off your laptop or is it on the owl? No, it should, be, it should all be on the owl. Oh, Let's now see. I hear it. Okay, much better. Thanks. Can you hear me? I stand and project right at it probably if I'm sitting behind my laptop. Maybe you can turn the... Maybe it's there. You have a little bit closer, also, to you, just make sure. I know sometimes this. Uh, All right. I don't know what closer is. Apologies. So let's make sure. Okay. All right. Can everybody hear me now? Stick yeah, up. Yeah. I, can, I can't hear the three. Say that again. I can't hear you. Okay, great. Okay, uh, once again, my name is Jeffrey Olson. Uh, this talk is introducing System R. Uh, in the first section, like I said, we will uh, do an introduction to Lambda Calculi and System R in particular. Uh, we'll use the Lambda Cube as a way to engage with that. I want to speak briefly about uh, TAPL by Pyrrhus. Um, and then I'd like to do a quick overview of System R from uh, Lexing to evaluation, and then also quickly touch on the extension and dialect system. The second part of uh, this will be interactive. Uh, I'll at that point disengage from the uh, slideshow and jump over to <clears throat> Visual Studio Code where I have the uh, code base and test harness set up. And then we can explore system R more concretely through a series of specs that are basically like, you look at the code and read it and understand it. And then you can answer uh, what, the, what the assertion is. Um, and then part three is a quick return back to the slides to uh, wrap it up and talk about the system R of tomorrow uh, to cover uh, intermediate, intermediate representations, building up and down, uh, looking at future enhancements, and then also, of course, your questions. Um, so with that, let's push ahead. Uh, really quickly about me, uh, I've been programming since maybe... Um, 2000, you know, the early 2000s, uh, I've been working professionally in technology since 2007, pretty much full-time as a developer since 2008, 2009. Uh, I've worked in several different domains and uh, right now I'm working as a uh, independent contractor. Um, most of my domain experience is in .NET and, you know, line of business systems and distributed systems. Um, and most of my spare time, probably for the past decade or more, I've been really interested in the Rust community. And more recently, I'm interested as well in uh, WASM, and uh, other web runtime yeah. systems. Okay. Uh, so with that, let's dive into uh, part one. So really quick uh, note about his the dual histories of, uh, that we're going to cover today. Uh, one is uh, the history of Lambda Calculi itself. I'm really not equipped to do that. Um, I can engage this material from a functional perspective and share that with you in a short time frame, but talking about the history and kind of, you know, these interplay between, uh, you know, mathematicians and early computer scientists uh, that continue, you know, up to this day that build up Lambda Calculus is, is really beyond the scope of this talk. Uh, but suffice to say, it started with the dialogue between Alonzo Church, uh, Curry Howard, or excuse me, uh, Haskell Curry, and um, a few other people um, starting in the 1930s with the untyped lambda calculus, and then from there, a uh, series of, you know, correspondences quickly produced the simply typed lambda calculus, and then over the next several decades, we have uh, incremental improvements in the expressiveness of the system as we kind of explore uh, different domains. Uh, and then separate from that, the history of system R itself, uh, I'll dive into probably a little bit more in detail uh, later on when we get to the code, um, where there's a pretty succinct summary of it, but suffice to say that I found uh, through, you know, my interest and in, and in looking for, uh, you know, it, documentation on Lambda, you know, Lambda Calculi 
and then uh, looking for practical implementations, I came across a, a pretty mature implementation of System F in Rust that I took and then adapted and added uh, several things to. Um, at this point, you know, it's 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 they're quite different and uh, they've diverged in features. Um, and also, you know, I think that the code base system where I've taken it and kind of updated it and maintained it, and it runs on Rust nightly now. Um, and so that's, you know, but like I said, we'll dive into it a little more, kind of the history of it uh, in a bit. So here we have uh, the Lambda Cube, which is a good analogy, but of course, you know, like all analogies, like it's not perfect, but it's useful for the purpose of this talk for exploring um, the ideas that uh, are, are, are the functionality of system R and kind of how uh, the Lambda Calculus builds up towards, um, you know, being able to do really cool things. And uh, so we just want to justify that as well as introduce the Lambda Calculus as well as the syntax of system. So uh, first things first, of course, we start with the untyped Lambda Calculus. Uh, that red dot uh, isn't an accident. It'll make sense in a second. Um, it's a really simple, uh, expression language although you know nowadays you can look at it and call it that um although you know back then i mean it, it exists as kind of a, a a certain formulation of uh of, of you know propositional logic um and it starts with just two terms abstraction and application um and so abstraction is really quickly is function definition and application of course is a uh, like equivalent to function invocation uh, and then adding to that the concepts of alpha conversion and beta reduction uh, really quickly alpha conversion um, it, it kind of like it's it, it covers stuff that you would think about if you cared about assembling formulas like written by hand over time baiting in letters and kind of you know gaming you know like when 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 the uh, lambda calculus was first developed they the the alpha conversion and beta reductions are kind of the mechanisms by which they kind of simulate computation which arises uh more explicitly later in the curry howard isomorphism which kind of says you know that these mathematical systems are equivalent to computational systems and there's a lot of other things where certain advanced versions of the lambda calculus are equivalent to other uh, more academic theoretical kinds of calculus um, and, you know, and from there providing a pathway to uh, computation as well because of, you know, equivalence down the chain. Uh, alpha conversion, though, concerned itself mostly with, I guess, the idea of, like, with multiple scopes of definitions interacting, making sure that none of the variable names interact. And we don't think that's a big deal, you know, as modern programmers now because we have languages with lexical scope. Uh, but like I said, when they are figuring this out, this stuff was new. And then beta reduction is a concept, you know, that you would call it like the mechanics of executing a formula uh, where values are kind of, you know, mechanically moved through the system and you can reduce an entire tree of terms down to a final term. And at some point when beta reduction starts, stops producing changes, and then you know that you have a well-formed, you know, final, and then that's equivalent to evaluation and computation as well. Um, and so with just those first two things, you are, you get a pretty rich language that can do, you know, even though you look at it and it seems like you can't do much, you can assemble all kinds of amazing stuff with it. Uh, just here, I talk about church numerals, um, which is an idea of just using untyped lambda calculus to encode numbers. And from there, you can build on top of it for all kinds of information encoding and uh, representing truthy and falsy values, and then, uh, you know, predicate operations and all kinds of logic stuff. Of course, the fixed point combinator, aka the Y combinator, is necessary for uh, recursion within computation and functions. Uh, separate from that, later on arises the issue of uh, recursion in type systems as well, which we'll kind of deal with in a passing way. Um, with these all things put together, uh, this pretty quickly in the correspondence, this thing called Curry's paradox uh, arises which says that based on kind of how loose, loosey-goosey the untyped lambda calculus is, um, it's easy to take a Y combinator and feed it back to itself. If you don't know what the Y combinator is, uh, it is necessary you know, in the lambda calculus to uh, do recursion. Um, and it's basically this operation that you apply to a function that takes a recursive function as the first argument. And the fix operation is what it's called, converts a normal function that takes a recursive function to call into another function that you can call without that recursive function and it implements and kind of implements a recursion. So with the uh, Curry's paradox and using the Y combinator and feeding it to itself, you can create a, a situation where a computation never reduces 
And, uh, you know, it just, it, it, it's equivalent to a, uh, you know, unbreaking, you know, you know, a, a, an endless loop. And so let's move on to actually showing that. So uh, this is the most, one of the most basic uh, expressions in the untyped lambda calculus. Uh, you can see here we have these little numbered helpers. Uh, the first, of course, is that slash, which is the lambda operator. Uh, from here on, I mostly refer to them as functions. Um, so it's helpful to think of it that way. Uh, the second item here we see is a parameter to the lambda. Uh, lambdas, of course, take one parameter. Uh, by default, currying is easily possible in the language, and we'll show that shortly. Um, the parameters apply within the scope, and uh, parameters to functions are always lowercase, of course. Next, we have the period, which is the projection operator um, within the you know top level you know I guess definition of a uh, lambda or a function. The projection is separating uh, the declaration portion from the actual uh, body. And lastly, we have the actual function uh, body, which is expression based. In this case, uh, this function takes in a single parameter named x and then immediately returns it. Uh, in lambda calculus circles is commonly known as the identity function. Uh, pretty straightforward at this point. Is everybody following? Any questions out there? Like silence as... Okay, <laughs> so uh, next example, uh, slightly more complex. We show parentheses for grouping uh, different sets of functionality together. Uh, the first, of course, is our identity function again in the first position, and then following it is uh, another function and it takes two parameters and it does this by occurring. You can see with the projections and then parameters following one right after another. Um, and then you get just get back one function and currying kind of occurs naturally in the syntax of the language. Um, and so you can see that with that, all it does is it just, you know, returns the X that's passed in. And so these two arranged together make up a function application. So before we showed function declaration or abstraction, and now we're showing function or lambda invocation or uh, application. And so here the uh, first function uh, is the thing that's being invoked and the second function is passed as a parameter. So in this case, it's just an identity function that just bounces back uh, this higher order function that's been passed. Uh, lastly, kind of just to you know, stretch this out a little bit uh, before a quick diversion, Oh, we have here um, an example of a uh, fixed point combinator uh, implemented in the n-type lambda calculus. Like I said, um, it, it looks pretty hairy and um, it's, it's pretty wild to reduce. I've never done it by hand, but uh, I've you know written you know examples um, and used it. And I mean, by golly, it works. Um, to you know, you pass it a function that, like I said, it takes a recursive function as its first argument, and then the additional fun you know uh, arguments after that. And then you can get back a function that you can invoke and it can do recursion as well as passing additional uh, arguments around. Um, and then the last thing here, just to point out, uh, is a free variable. And so free variables uh, in the context of the Lambda calculus uh, programs are either open or closed. And open means the program has free variables in it that haven't been bound, so you don't fully know their information. It doesn't matter so much in the, the untyped lambda calculus, but it's a thing that uh, exists and is tackled in alpha con, uh, alpha conversion. Um, and, you know, you can detect kind of as a process of you know making sure that there are no uh, variable conflicts. You can also find unbound variables, and so you can determine as well if a program is open or not through that process. Um, but that's just you know, good to show here because it's a thing that exists theoretically, although in practical system R uh, or system F, you're not going to see, you're going to see a fully closed program with any built-in intrinsics being used. Um, quick diversion to uh, look at Wikipedia. Uh, so if you, you know, wanted to just hop off this call right now, I would say just go to the Lambda Calculus uh, um, article and read it. It's amazing. Um, and it's a, it's a great resource in addition to TAPL. I learned a lot here, but in particular, I always really like, and I've returned to this a lot when kind of gotten fuzzy in my memory, um, but uh, around church numerals and kind of how encoding of uh, numbers and numerals um, can work. And um, it's, pretty, it, it's, it's, it's pretty nifty. And then from there, you know, like I said, you can encode numerals and then you can get the successor function, you know, which, which that you can quickly conduct a, a you know, uh, compose a queried function that can do, you know, just regular addition. Um, you can, you know, do multiplication powers with the predecessor. You can implement uh, subtraction. 
And then moving on to as well, um, you can create truthy and falsy values um, and represent them pretty easily in the untyped lambda calculus. And then from there, you really just get a whole slew of logical operators. And um, it, it, I'm going to show this in the next slide. It'll be uh, pretty pretty amusing, um, kind of what what it looks like at that point when you, you start mapping in. Just if you kind of add this basic idea of just like we're just going to map and expose these intrinsics, um, and they're these things, you know. And we'll not even necessarily call it like a let or a, you know declaration or anything. We just kind of they're there and they're mapped. Um, so with that in mind, jump back to the slideshow. Okay. Um, and then I wanted to just show like this last code example really quick. Uh, this would be an example of with everything in place, um, you know, like I said, with those intrinsics uh, specified, kind of an example of what um, a, 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 a fully kind of fleshed out function that would do something interesting looks like. Um, so uh, one of the things that's new here that I didn't really introduce is the fix operator. So like I said, that's how you would implement a recursion. Um, you have the fix operator, and then in the tail position is the function that's going to be um, converted into a recursive function, and that's enclosed within these parentheses. And then to that function, which is now the thing that's here in the lead position, we're passing 10 and, um, and this additional, uh, or excuse me, um, no, yeah, we're passing 10 and then uh, an handler here. And so does anybody, uh, like, off the top of their head, know what this what this does? Could they, could you take a guess at it? Okay, um, <laughs> that's funny. Uh, it um, what this does is this is a uh, what's that? So ten is zero. Um, not quite. This is the function. So this is a, this is actually not super readable. I don't blame anybody, um, and it's not you know knock on anyone for not understanding it. Um, this first function here, what this is, is a recursive basically countdown function that will be passed a number and a, another function, and it will so it itself is a recursive higher order function, and based on the number that it's passed, it will execute that function that many times as it counts down to zero. Um, and then we take that thing and define it, uh, and then we pass it 10, and then the function that all it does um, is check if x is zero. Um, it's, I, I guess I'll take a second to try and kind of break down and explain how this works. Um, to me, I guess one of the things that's interesting about it, I don't know if this occurs to anybody else, but it looks very Lisp-like to me once you start throwing in keywords and, you know, it starts, they start looking like special, you know, kind of like, you know, macros, you know, or whatever. Um, and you, you realize kind of, you know, there's the front position. So you can see how a uh, Lisp, you know, kind of falls out of this as well. And, you know, and they're, and they're uh, you know, implicit and explicit connections. Um, but so really quickly, like I said, there's fix. And then there's this function. So this function takes a recursive function. So this is it calling itself. That's what this parameter is. This is the counter. And this is the function that it's going to invoke. The first thing we have is this test. And so the test has three uh, parameters that are passed to it. You know, it's a, it's a current function. And the first one is the thing that it, or uh, the thing that it's going to test. And if it's truthy, then it executes the sec the first branch. And if it's falsy, excuse me, so this, and I, I, I needed to, uh, you know, color code these parentheses because it gets tricky. Um, this is the first branch of the if, and then, excuse me. Oh no, excuse me, okay. Yeah, so about this guy. So this is the first branch and then this is the second. So if this is false, then it just returns zero. Otherwise, if this is a truthy value, if C is not zero, then it executes this branch, which is another if. And the first thing it does is it executes the function it was passed. And if the function returns a truthy value, remember, this is the function that's going to be passed. And all it does is it checks if it's X is not zero. So it will keep returning true, at which point we now recurse but first we decrement, that's what this pred uh, C is, we're decrementing the counter and we pass that function, at which point we recurse back to the beginning and we keep doing this until we get to zero. And we would just invoke the function. Uh, it doesn't do anything here, you know, but I mean, in this case, it's be like invoking the function for a side effect. Um, this isn't like any kind of functional operation. This is just an example of kind of mechanically uh, how you can, you know, get the system to do stuff. Also, a uh, disclaimer, I did never actually had a chance to debug this code because I don't have an untyped lambda calculus 
interpreter on hand. It matches this uh, syntax, um, but uh, a bunch of the other stuff that we see um, from here on out, uh, will, especially in the second section, will be. Okay. So, what? Why do you have two if then else statements? So it looks like both the if then else statements are checking that C is not zero, correct? Uh, the first one checks that C is not zero, and then the second one executes the func executes the function that was passed in, which is the exact same check. You are correct, but really that uh, it's arbitrary functionality. This tail function could be anything. It could be it could be like in, it could be loading files, or it could be you know pulling in bytes for side effects. Oh, process. I see, I see, I see, I see. So so this would be like a this is this would be like a loop that yeah. that performs a task, and then and then if the task succeeds, then it does it. 10 more times or something. Yeah, it's kind of a, it, it demonstrates crude iteration uh, in the okay. untyped. Okay. Okay, great. So uh, going from there, um, we move on to the simply typed lambda calculus. So because of uh, Curry's paradox, which I talked about uh, briefly earlier, um, Alonzo Church kind of quickly, you know, kind of uh, devises and introduces the concept of a type system. So the terms that are expressed, they now have types. Um, that, you know, kind of are uh, separate and associated from their, um, associated with, but separate from their values. Uh, we introduced the concept of type constructors and the first type constructor is one for making function types. And then we, you know, also would introduce a fixed set of built-in types like the natural numbers, booleans, and uh, probably also we'd add literals as well. Um, show a quick example of this. Uh, and now in this uh, code example, again, we have the uh, identity function, but now it has a type. Uh, the colon uh, within parameters separates um, on the left-hand side the variable name from the right-hand side type. Uh, here, nat, uh, nat is the type of var x. Um, in the second example, we show the arrow operator. And so here, uh, this is a function x, or excuse me, a function x in, you know, x and v that takes two arguments. The one is a uh, function that takes in a nat and returns a bool, and the second argument is a nat. And then uh, it just, you know, evaluate, it passes those things in and then returns whatever it returns. Um, so both of these are examples of types uh, that appear, you know, in, in type position. And so the idea is within type position, there's a restricted dialect uh, of, of terms that are allowed within there, and those represent the type system, but they're separate from, uh, you know, like actual full general purpose terms. Um, a, a goal that kind of we'll get to uh, to expand this system is to allow arbitrary terms into type position, which leads towards dependent types. Uh, at this point now with the simply type lambda calculus introduced, it's a good time to talk about what I call non-lambda cube features. These are things like our uh, algebraic data types, so product types, which commonly we call tuples. Uh, also records are kind of there as a kind of convenience papering over tuples. Rust has uh, structs as well as tuples, and they all kind of have specific, because of the implementation details of Rust, uh, they have kind of specific memory representations, but also they you know, fit within the product type category uh, within algebraic data types. And then we also have some types, uh, enums in Rust or uh, data types uh, in Haskell with uh, some types um, where, uh, the product type is all of these things together make up uh, a value that satisfies that type. Well, the sum type, you're saying it's one, any one of these multiple variants. And so we'll get into uh, product and sum types uh, pretty quickly because they become very uh, useful uh, once you introduce pattern matching and uh, the case expression. Uh, you're, if you're familiar with it uh, as match from other languages, I mean, this exists pretty much in all um, of the... Uh, you know, more strictly type functional languages, Haskell, OCaml, F Sharp, uh, you know, uh, Rust, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so I'm not going to kind of do a deep dive mechanically right this second into what pattern matching is, but I will kind of show the code and the elegance of it uh, as, as it exists within uh, system R and, and kind of it's derived from a Rust's pattern matching exhaustiveness system. Um, and then also finally, let polymorphism, um, which is, uh, if you're familiar, of course, you know, uh, functional languages, you know, the let keyword is kind of, you know, for, for declaring uh, values and setting them aside um, often immutably. Um, but within kind of this context, it's introduced as let polymorphism and it has some structural differences that make it more kind of, of an organizing system for larger sets of code and the way to kind of string together multiple lets. Uh, as single expressions together with, you know, some final kernel of activity with all of that built up context. 
And so it looks pretty ugly in practice. And I think that, you know, like, like, like go to considered harmful. I think there have been let polymorphism considered harmful papers written. Um, and people, you know, you shouldn't write programs with it, but it's really useful for, you know, if you were going to write, say, a higher level language and then spit out a lambda calculus uh, from it, let polymorphism is a su super useful way. It, um, you know, it subsumes and is a superset of any module system you ever wanted to express. It's also way more concrete and easy to reason about. Uh, let rex within, you know, and all the, the lets within the, um, the the Lisp world are possible to be modeled within it. And so it's it's really powerful organizing tool for uh, for higher level languages. And so now we'll dive into some examples. Uh, so here for, uh, you know, product types, we show a paren style uh, type constructor for tuples. Um, this is a tuple that takes two nats. Um, and then we have uh, an example of using the projection operator, the period again, to project into uh, the uh, tuple value to pull out a parameter in one of the positions by zero index. Uh, in the second example, we have uh, some type constructor, and you can see pretty straightforward uh, curly braces delimited. Um, we have labeled variants, we have nil variants, and we have a bar separator. Um, would we'll kind of dive more into uh, what's there because it makes sense in the context of what comes immediately after it, of course, which is the beginning of a case expression um, operating on the bar X, which is passed into this function. And uh, then the of delimits that. After that, uh, we get the actual individual arms of the case expression. And so those are delimited by the bars. Um, the exhaustiveness will be validated during the type checking process, but you know, suffice to say that's something that's necessary so that you can kind of have soundness. Um, and then within an actual individual arm, the first portion we have the pattern, you know, aka, you know, like full destructuring. And um, it's, you know, these are things that kind of have trickled down to a lot of uh, non-functional languages over time and that people are really interested about. But it's really uh, interesting and notable kind of how elegant it is and how this is just built, you know, from the ground up. And it's all there. Um, and, and it works, you know, great because it's just, you know, from the get-go. Um, and so I guess now is a pretty... Um, good time actually to kind of really quickly dive into the implementation of patterns just to kind of just demonstrate really easily how they work. Um, so I'm looking within here. So this is the top level module for patterns, and this is the uh, main enum for expressing it uh, as, a, as a term within uh, system R. So these variants, uh, this is Rust code, um, they cover what the, all the different kinds of uh, patterns that you can have. And it's really straightforward. You have the any wildcard pattern, also the underscore. Um, this always matches. Uh, also case expressions are, are, are you know checked from first down and they have to be exhaustive, but ordering matters. Um, the next possible uh, pattern is a literal. So any literals that are supported, and I can really quickly show that. Uh, you can see we have the unit type, we have Booleans, we have the natural numbers, uh, tags, which I'll show a little bit later, as well as uh, byte literals. Um, so any of those things could exist uh, in, in, in pattern position. Of course, commonly a variable binding. Um, of course, we can have products. And the product type can be a vector of pattern. So any of these other things can exist within there. We can have uh, constructors for individual arms of a sum type, showing the string for the label, and then a uh, pattern for the actual uh, constructor portion. Um, and then I also mentioned that this uh, system R is built for extensibility. I'll talk uh, quite a bit more about this later, but suffice to say that in all of these uh, language constructs, we have tokens, terms, um, we have types, we have patterns, you know, these, these basic, they, they, because the system is extensible, we have to add a, a variant to account for uh, extensibility. And then when these systems are actually reified at runtime, when the actual lexing parsing happens, uh, there's an actual concrete dialect that may or may not provide extended behavior. Um, the actual dialect that the interpreter for system R is written for is called the bottom dialect. And all higher dialects should translate down towards it. I have an example of a dialect that translate down, translates down into the bottom dialect, and then you can execute it. Um, and you know, and, and run it, and it shows kind of the idea of, of how these things can be built up. Anyways, this uh, exists everywhere, and it's pervasive throughout the system. So going back to the slideshow. Uh, okay, so I said pattern full structuring. Uh, we talked about patterns in system R. 
Um, and then the last bit, of course, is there's the, the big arrow, and then that separates the pattern from the expression. So if the pattern is matched that in that arm, then we evaluate the expression with any bindings uh, that, that, are, that happen uh, in that arm uh, pattern. Any questions? Send the questions in chats. Okay. All right. Uh, next, we have an example of the uh, let, let polymorphism via the let keyword. So here uh, we show a uh, let keyword in a lead position. And then next is the new binding created for this let. So this is a pattern, which means that uh, based on whatever you're storing here, we could you know have arbitrary uh, patterns destructuring the, the information that's returned. Uh, we have an equal sign that separates that binding portion from the value expression, which when this is evaluated and, and when the let is evaluated, it's going to evaluate the contents of the value expression and store that in that binding. Um, the in keyword separate, basically the equal sign and the in keyword delimit the entire contents of the value expression. And so then with those things put together, the following after in is what you would call the effective scope for the let expression. And so um, you evaluate this last after the, you know, the, the, the value expression has been uh, computed and stored. And then um, you're able to now use that binding in this uh, scope. So of course you can kind of see like how this just, you know, looks a lot like a uh, lexical scope in other languages, um, but kind of just mechanically works a little differently uh, since it's purely expression-based kind of the stuff you do and you can't really do, you know, like executing multiple things one after another without special constructs or kind of ways to cheat and, you know, short treat kind of do things uh, that you know, you'd say are not in the spirit of functional programming. Um, you know, and of course, practical languages always have to get into side effects, which is something that's not accounted for here. Uh, okay, so with that out of the way, we now can move beyond the uh, simply type lambda calculus and talk about the next dimension of complex uh, complexity, which kind of goes in three directions. And the first of those is type polymorphism. And the basic idea is that we introduce type abstraction. So the way that we, the same way we can abstract, we, we can do function abstraction, we can declare new functions, and then we can pass values into an auto. Now we can um, do type abstraction at the function abstraction boundary. So within this context, type polymorphism is basically integrated with and tightly coupled to functions. So we have type abstraction at the function abstraction boundary, which I'll show in a second, as well as type application at the function application boundary. So what that means is when you declare a function, you can introduce new, you know, polymorphic types, generic types. And then within the scope of that, or excuse me, when you then take that, you know, polymorphic function and you invoke it or you want to apply it, you have to set a concrete type and that's type application. And so we'll show an example of this. Uh, basically, this is system F. Um, and we'll kind of get into, you know, so this makes up, a, a, although a bunch of additional things uh, kind of, you know, comprise what is a complete system F system because you deal with kind of uh, the, the details of the type system and th other things that come up. Um, but anyways, we'll show an example of this. So once again, we're back to our generic identity function. Uh, we have the benefits of let polymorphism now, so we can kind of organize it a little better and we can show abstraction and application together. Uh, first, we have the let and the value of it is a new function, which the first thing it does is it introduces the new type. And you see we're using that uh, slash again. Uh, in the literature, there is a separate kind of uppercase lambda that looks you know, like a straight triangle uh, that would be used in addition to the lowercase lambda, which is for uh, function, function abstraction. So this is basically type abstraction, then the immediately the function abstraction, and those two things together are like associated. And really, that type abstraction is subordinate to the function. Um, and then, but from there, it's a normal function again, and we're using that type var that we introduced previously within the scope of that function. Uh, if this function had subfunctions that were also polymorphic and it wanted to propagate that type forward, it would be using that when it would do app, when it would apply the type uh, within the body of the function. But instead here, we're just returning. So this, uh, this function is stored in the value of I. And then we come and we now do a, a function application. So we also have to do type application. And so if you know, you're familiar with generic systems, this is the way you reify types when you do you know, a generic invocation. Or you, and, you know, say in, in C Sharp or .NET, you have a list of T. And once you actually fulfill what that T is in the actual application code, you, that, 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 that is type application. Um, 
So here, once again, like I said, this is just the generic identity function. It's going to return and echo back whatever it's handled. Uh, the next axis away um, from uh, the type polymorphism is what would be considered uh, dependent types. And so the kind of the, 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 the distinction between them is that for type polymorphism, you have what are called terms that take types, which they really mean functions that take types. For dependent types, you're talking about types that take terms, which is the idea of kind of arbitrary values or maybe special restricted set, like say just the natural numbers that become a part of the type. The canonical example for this, of course, is fixed lake vectors. Uh, in a language like Rust, that's important because Rust actually considers, you know, a C style memory representation. Uh, but in, um, you know, in, in higher, uh, you know, fu functional languages, usually that's just used kind of as a way to enforce, you know, strictness uh, around the type system. Of course, dependent types can do a lot more than that, um, but you kind of have to fully develop it to explore it. And honestly, I'm, I'm not equipped uh, here to talk about it. Uh, the last axis kind of moving from the front pane to the back pane uh, is generalized type constructors. And this isn't a big deal on its own. Um, we have, and we already showed examples with kind of how the type system has been enriched with algebraic data types and how there's these multiple type constructors being introduced, but they're kind of narrow in their context and you can't find new symbols with them. You have to declare them and repeat them over and over. Well, a generalized type constructor means that you have basically a facility similar to let for you know, storing values, including functions, but instead for declaring and, and, and setting aside types. So any language that has that functionality, which really is like, you know, you know, any, any function, you know, or any, many, many languages have it is the, I, you know, it's kind of an advancement uh, over um, and kind of separate from uh, system F and other languages. Uh, but really the cube starts to make sense when you move from the front pane to the back pane and you apply the idea of generalized type scriptures to both dependent type systems and type polymorphic systems. From that point, you start getting, you know, once those type constructors are adapted to those two systems, you know, their respective systems, those systems become a lot more powerful. System F becomes, I believe, system F omega uh, is what it's called. And that's really just, it's just system F with, um, with, with, type, with type polymorphic friendly type constructors. And so, you know, and from there, you know, you're, you're pretty much at, you know, Haskell, OCaml, you know, most kind of your, your, your typical, um, you know, level of complexity. Uh, you know, the one place where, you know, Haskell kind of separates itself is the way that through, you know, uh, in, in, in a pretty uh, intelligible way uh, with monads that you can kind of represent uh, state flow and mutation and, you know, by then as well as a full effect system. Um, and so all of those things kind of, you know, you're building up towards this crescendo of convergence on what is known as the calculus of constructions, uh, Agda and Coke are theorem provers that kind of exist in this space. It's fair to note as well, though, that in, if you move forward to the front pane, there's a there's a, a calculus that's the combination of type polymorphism and dependent types, but without type constructors. And it's not really useful, of course, you know, until you actually move to the fully realized system. Um, we're actually not there, though. Today, we're mostly going to be where the blue dot is in the upper left corner. And then I'll probably show you an example that moves over toward the purple dot in the upper left. Uh, of course, this is isn't the only lambda cube, um, and you know the concept of the cube is arbitrary. As I said at the beginning, it's an analogy, and analogies break down uh, over kind of you know when they're overanalyzed. Uh, this isn't the totality of type systems, and things go in in different directions. And the goal with system R is to provide a strong foundational base um, to do interesting things. Uh, really quickly, talk about this book. I brought it with me. Uh, I use it mostly as a reference. Uh, it is uh, Types and Programming Languages by Benjamin Pierce. Um, in, in this space, it, it covers pretty much everything up through that I discussed here, up through System App in great detail, provides a, and talks about implementations in other languages, and also gets into basically proving the soundness and edges of the soundness uh, of these systems. Um, it's, uh, I came to it through uh, the code base that I adapted for System R. And I realized that I needed it kind of to understand the dark corners of uh, the, the code base I, I, I adopted. And so I took that and then, you know, in addition to other sources I've shown, uh, it's, it's really good stuff. Um, so really quickly, uh, now we're going to talk about um, 
how a compilation happens in a uh, system R. And so uh, for sake of brevity, I'm just actually gonna run this forward to the end and you can look at this and see the complete chain. Um, we have a corpus uh, of code. It's fed into the parser subsystem, which has its own internal multi-step loop. Uh, the parser subsumes the lexer in this case, and it takes in the text and it just feeds it to the lexer and, and basically takes tokens and then has a recursive process where with the next token, it knows what kind of, you know, maybe a, a more complex term it's entering into. So it can set expectations for what the following tokens are allowed to be. And if they aren't those things, then it can, you know, basically create parser errors. And so in this way, uh, we get out a fully formed term, which we can pass through the type check in subsystem. The first thing that happens is we do the aliasing uh, up to this point. All of the variables are stored in De Bruyne indexes, which are uh, created in the parser subsystem. And then when the parser subsystem is taken apart, uh, kind of like a ru in Rust affine types terms, we, we basically retire that type and we pull out the contents of it and use it for other things. We take those De Bruyne indexes and we pass them on to the type system. And the first thing it does is it basically de-aliases all those variables, puts all the actual things back in there. And then we can run through and walk the entire full tree of terms and validate all the types. And so the, all the type system, you know, subsystem check is doing is just walking all the terms and validating that the types for terms that are nested within and the types that bubble out are all, you know, everything connects together. And then from that, you have a, a fully validated term, which is actually a tree of nested terms. So it's, it's like a, it's like an abstract, abstract syntax tree. Once again, these things, you know, the uh, Curry-Howard correspondence shows, you know, isomorphism that these things are connected. We can move from theoretical concepts to concrete, uh, more concrete computer science concepts and, you know, on towards real systems. Uh, but you can take that, that uh, type checked and valid term and you can pass it to the evaluation subsystem, which honestly, all it does is alpha conversion and beta reduction and just choose right through it until uh, the term doesn't change anymore. And at that point, it's fully evaluated. If an error arises along the way, you know, we deal with it. Uh, so up to this point, you have to ask, what is this useful for? And I uh, really just run through this quick code. Um, in particular, we present a sequence of refinements of algebraic effects going by a multi-prompt delimited control, generalized evidence passing, yield bubbling, and finally a monadic translation into a plain lambda calculus, which can be compiled efficiently to many target platforms. Uh, this is from GA and Lion uh, from 2021. It's an awesome paper, um, kind of one of many papers that go back, I guess, at this point, more than 10 years uh, around COCA and um, uh, effect handlers um, based systems and effect systems where you type systems expanded to handle computational effects. You know, so it's another kind of direction of the cube where we basically are polymorphic over computation. So uh, if you're familiar with the function uh, coloring problem, you know that effect handlers can subsume that. And so um, it's, it's a really powerful system. But all they're saying here is that they have a bunch of higher concepts and they know how to walk down through all of those back to uh, a proven, you know, Lambda calculus. And all of their proofs in the paper are just showing how these higher representations are sound as they move down. And then at one point they're like, and now it's just regular system F and you know, system F is good and we're cool. And so that's kind of the power of this is this idea. Um, and this has been you know, happening in the academy for decades, of course, um, but it just exists in paper. Their ideas or their concrete implementations are done in C or, they're, or in the case of COCA, it's like Haskell and you know, C and um, or WASM. And uh, you know, they're, they're, these are like actual, like they reify the Lambda calculi as actual computational systems. And, uh, but system R is operating at a higher level. Um, so in order to kind of tie this together and why it makes sense, we have to talk about dialect and extensibility. Um, and it's pretty straightforward. If you imagine the previous compilation system, you can just say all steps extend on a compilation extension API, where if they encounter extended types in the lexer, in the parser, or in the type system, in the type check process, because they've been generated by previous steps, we know how to call in and tend to for this dialect and handle that. And then we can then take that information and we do, you know, the, everything up through type check can just be consistent. It's one system flow, but there's just these extensions for different dialect features. And then the last step is you have to be able to translate that back down to the bottom dialect. Like was, was described in that quote uh, in the previous slide, you have a mechanical facility to basically translate your higher order lambda calculus into a lower one, aka the bottom dialect 
And at that point, you can just pass it to the eval subsystem as before. Um, okay, so uh, any questions at this point? We don't see any questions online. All right, great. We're going to move into the interactive portion. Um, we will see uh, how it goes. Um, and to be honest, if we're just if I'm just crushing y'all, um, I'll cut you guys some slack because mm -hmm. um, you know this stuff is pretty uh, inscrutable. And I mean, I, I've, I've stared at it for many many hours, so of course it makes sense to me. Um, but you know, your mileage may vary. Uh, so this is the code base for System R. It is a uh, pretty straightforward um, Rust code base. It is a what you call a workspace uh, based code base. So it has several sub crates within it. that are self-contained libraries, executables, et cetera. Um, we have a definition of the members. And then of course we have the defaults, which kind of just drives the behavior of a uh, cargo itself. Um, and then within these top level uh, folders, we have the actual implementation. Going from the top, we have the dialects. So this is actual implementations of uh, sub dialects. I really only have one right now. And uh, I'll show that in a bit. We have the evaluation subsystem. It actually has a testing interface, which depends on system R and kind of knows about extensions. And then the actual interpreter or the bottom dialect eval system. And that is like, it only knows about the bottom dialect. It's like fits to it. So the idea is you have to, you have to translate down into a bottom dialect if you want to pass it in. Um, and then we have a, our a, a test suite um, for this. Uh, you should, uh, you just know that um, I'm a big fan of, uh, I guess, Cucumber, uh, Gherkin style tests. So we'll be exploring that um, for the interactive portion. Um, and then uh, we have the actual implementation of System R itself. This is broken down into uh, kind of several major subsystems for uh, the process that I showed above in the previous slides. Um, and then, of course, lastly, we have the X tasks, which are just extensions for cargo for uh, certain things like generating coverage reports and some other stuff that I have planned for the future. Uh, okay, so a good place also to start uh, is to look at the README for this code base. Uh, this is on GitHub, of course. Um, and so uh, really, it's pretty brief and succinct. Um, I keep the uh, description of system F from the original README from the original code base. Uh, it does a pretty good job of describing what was there. Um, you know, I, I consider myself standing on the shoulder of giants, um, benefiting from that. And so, uh, you know, but I'm taking extending it. I cleaned it up, uh, added several things. Um, and then again, here is the uh, explanation of uh, the system itself. Uh, but now let's go ahead and just dive into the code. So what I have here is one special set aside uh, Gherkin feature that features a set of tests that are all kind of stubbed out. And the idea is you read the code and understand it, and then you can basically solve the test. Um, here I go ahead and run it. You can see it says 10 scenarios, 10 skipped. The reason is for each one of these specs, the last step is a step that actually doesn't exist because I just put garbage characters in there. And then as we run through and fix each one, we expect the number to go down. So starting at the top, we just have uh, scenario zero. And um, you can, for the most part, just ignore, you know, or you can, you know, look at the steps, but just understand that they're kind of turning the uh, system R machinery in the background through the testing interface and the eval crate, um, and then, you know, validating that everything looks good. And then, of course, we can look at the final value. So uh, this first one here, of course, this is a straightforward uh, non-generic identity function that we invoke and pass in 64. Does anybody know what the uh, resulting value of, invo of evaluating this would be? Approximately 64. Very good. <laughs> All right, great. Watch. So here we go. We run it. Whoa, one passed. All right. 10%. All right. Um, up next, uh, scenario one. Let along with the generic identity function, and we're applying bool. Uh, once again here, uh, we know the revolt resulting eval is going to be a Boolean type. I mean, it can only be one of one of two. Which do you think it is? Sure. Nice. All right, uh, once again, again with NAT, at this point, you guys know exactly how this works, generic NAT function, okay, I'm not, I'm not gonna, you know, insult anybody's intelligence. But we're getting there, all right, we got three passed, we got seven, seven to go, don't worry, it, uh, it gets really hard really fast. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so here now we get to see a case and, uh, you know, algebraic data types. Um, so I'll just say really quick that this is like a basic uh, Swizzler function. So if you understand what that is, you could probably cheat um, and, and say, does anybody have a crack at what this is? This is also kind of unfair because you have to, I don't know if you want to describe it. It's not just a single uh, thing. It reverses a tuple. Yeah, exactly. So there, there you go. 
<laughs> I read the source. I've, I've done I've done a little bit of rust. I've done I've sharp some pattern matching, so I can tell from the pattern matching that the last claw is going to be cute. It's actually not as hard as it looks. Yeah, this is just a, a reading exercise. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so moving on next, uh, we have a couple other concepts to cover uh, that I didn't really talk about before. Platform bindings. So this is the idea. Uh, this is the concrete mechanism. This is an enhancement that I added for uh, how you'd expose. You know the. the P invoke basically, you know, the idea of how you call the underlying system. And so right now there's a Rust API where you can supplant and you can pass in uh, stuff to all the parsing, type checking, and evaluation. And it does uh, validation at each point along the way to make sure that everything uh, lines up. The API allows you to kind of do uh, good enough for system F typing, as you know, but it's a separate type system from Rust. But of course, you know, it's a Rust API. Uh, so from that, just know that we get these two functions, NAT add and NAT sub. Um, this is really actually easy. I can just tell you this is a Fibonacci function, and all we want to know is what Fib4 is. So does anybody three. know what Fib4 is? What's that? Well, let's wait. Fib4 fib is three. Without right? zero. Without zero. And we're skipping. Yeah, this implementation uh, includes zero. <laughs> okay. What is four? Four, what is it? four, four plus three. Plus three. One, two, three, yeah. five. Okay. So, all right, halfway there. Okay, up next we have unfold part one. So this is the thing I didn't really get into. I mentioned uh, recursion in um, the uh, uh, functional recursion, which fix enables, but also uh, as you kind of make these type systems more complex, you have the concept of recursive types. And so uh, they're, they're unrestrained recursive types are in sound. Um, and they're not allowed in a lot of different languages for pretty good reasons. Uh, like in Rust in particular, you have to box them and set them aside so you don't have you know, full, full recursion uh, at the static level. You have to have that pointer in direction. Um, and here we have that as well. Um, and so what we have is this specification of a recursive type. And then we have to set aside a label because we know by nature of it being recursive, it's going to recurse back into itself uh, some point later. You could call this this or self if you wanted. Um, it just, you know, you understand that that's the recursive type and the actual contents of the type are, you know, basic algebraic type and we have a nil variant and then the other is a cons and it is that cons is the label and but the contents of it are a tuple of nat and then the second, uh, the item in the second position is uh, the recursive, the recursive list. So because we don't have type constructors in uh, the normal bottom dialect of system R, uh, this type is repeated over and over and over, and it's a ton of noise. Um, I'm going to actually turn it up to 11 a little later, but really what you want to say is that this is a car function. If you're familiar with Lisp, especially like scheme, if you've ever done the little schemer, you know, car, uh, cutter, cons, you know, et cetera. Um, so all um, you just have to guess about what it is. And I'll say that we create this car function, which is doing all this stuff with this, uh, and then it does unfold. And this is how you actually interact uh, with the type in a case a structure. This code won't compile uh, if the unfold isn't there. Um, and it's part of it is kind of, uh, it allows you to destructure it. At this point, this is the actual recursive type again. This is that cons. And the second parameter is the recursive type. Part of the unfold kind of makes this like not recursive anymore. So if you ever want to actually do functional recursive, which I'll show in a later example, you have to do an additional step because the unfold kind of unpacks it. But like you can't you can't pattern match on it unless you use this. The, the unfold is kind of a, a you know like the abstraction step uh, that you have to insert at execution time when you evaluate a recursive type. So it's just kind of the, you know noise of the language. Um, but this is kind of how, how you, you rationalize it. So, like I said, it's this uh, function called car, and then we know that we just pass it this uh, cons list. So, once again, it's this type. This is really hideous, but all you need, you know, if you understand that it's basic, it's either a nil or it's a cell of a nat and then a following item. You can see this is like basically a linked list is what this is, or, you know, a, a cons cell, right, that has a car and a cutter. Um, and so you see that this is the car of the first cell, 
And then the second, uh, the cutter becomes basically the cons for the next one. So we can see we have 10, 20, and then we have the end of the list as nil. So really what this is, is a linked list of three items. Uh, the first two are uh, nats, and then the last is the nil that terminates it. So the, the utility here of the recursive type is basically, you know, generic, you know, types, um, you know, and the ability to kind of do like what you would do with like a linked list and other languages. So we're going to take this linked list and we're going to feed it into car. Does anybody know what the answer is? 40? 10? 10. Let's try 10. Correct. It is 10 because what this function does is it returns the car, which is the lead item off of the list. So this is actually, uh, like I said, I'll, I'll show recursion. Um, an example uh, a little later, but um, all we're doing here, and it's just what happens here, is we're saying, hey, you handed in this list. It's the argument to this function. Um, and we're going to, you know, match on it. And if it's a const cell, just return the first item. So all this is going to take, if you hand it, it's going to be the first car of the first item. You know, and if it's nil, you return zero instead. If you, if you, you know, if that was all just here in this pipe. All right. Very, very good. So next, let's take a take a break from that, um, and actually, once again, kind of talk about uh, recursion uh, with fix. We kind of visited it briefly with Fibonacci. Um, here's kind of another example of uh, what we do, although it's probably a little trickier to guess what this does. Does anybody have any idea what this does? Well, in case recurses, and whenever you reach a zero, every time you whatever the second value. So I keep recursing until. It hits zero for the first one. Yes. So that's part of it. This value, it's going to recurse down this many times. That's the first part. And so we see here, if we look at this function, Z is that recurse is the recursive function. So where Z is invoked, that's where the action is going to be, where the recursion is. So once again, you know, we're passing in uh this is the first. Um so Y zero is the, the first thing that was passed in, right? So it's it's these two nats. And so we're taking that first item and we're decrementing it. That's what this, this is taking. So we're, and then we're actually, and, and then we're taking the second one and we're basically adding two to it. And then we're repackaging that up as a, another tuple and we're passing it back to Z. So what you can say is that for the number that's passed in, it's gonna that many times, it's gonna add two to this starting number. So it's pretty straightforward. I guess. It's like a fixed, Ten. it's like a yes, it's like a fixed times two. I know this is kind of backwards. Um, but uh, you know, th th this code isn't really meant to be, you know, elegant or nice to look at, but like, you know, it's it's what's you know remarkable is just like uh like I said, how um basically approachable, you know, kind of it is and, and how it makes sense. Okay, so there we go um, on full part one, recursion with fix. Oops, I did not fix this. I didn't, it didn't pass because it was still misnamed. There we go, seven pass, three to go. All right, this is the doozy. This is the big one. This is the, this is the big thinking one. Um, oh man. Yeah, return 14. Yikes. <laughs> yeah, you don't talk about that part. <laughs> oh, dude, okay, I need to turn on word rat. I think it's 15. <laughs> yeah, so um, this is this is related to the first one. Uh, you could say that this is an evolution of the first function. Uh, it, it, it uses type recursion, which we showed in Unfold Part 1, along with, you know, functional recursion, which we showed in our previous example, as well as with Fibonacci. Um, and... Uh, you know, it's so it's interesting what's here. And this is like, you know, like I said, it's completely mechanical. It's different from, you know, many other programming languages. But what this is doing uh, is this we're setting aside this L function. And what L is, is it's going to be a recursive function that is going to um, take in the first thing is a uh, this is the, uh, the the arrow type. So this is the fun This is the recursive function. The first value of it is that recursive type. This is pretty hairy here. And it has to be surrounded in parentheses. Then we have the arrow, and it returns a nat. So the second parameter is a list. 
um, of our recursive type. Once again, the recursive type occurs many, many times here, and it creates a ton of noise. Uh, if you're able to do, if you have a you know type constructor and you can set aside that type in a type constructor, suddenly this becomes you know a lot less uh, damaging on your on your eyes. Um, from that, we take a case and uh, we dive into um, the the list again. What's that? Mm, not quite. What it does is it dives into the list, and if it is not nil, but it's a cons, it then wants to see what the second element of the cons cell is. And if that is another cons cell, which means the list continues, it's going to recurse back into itself. And this is the thing I showed you with, or I mentioned earlier about these, once you do unfold on these types, it kind of breaks the recursiveness of it. So if I want to actually take this and be a thing that I can feed back to the recursive function, I actually have to reconstruct it. And that's what happens here. And you can see cons of blah, 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 blah. Like that's, that's this type. And then I'm feeding that into the, back into the recursive function. So really what this does is it does the opposite of the previous one. Um, and it's just going to, instead of returning the first L the first car of the first element of the list, it's going to walk all the way down the list until it gets to the end and then back up and grab the previous element. So it's equivalent to last, you would say, in a linked list. It finds the null terminator and then it backs up. So, you know, I throw this one as a freebie, um, but uh, it's 20 is the answer. Uh, like I said, there we go. Eight pass, two to go. The rest are a breeze. I promise you'll be able to make sense of them at this point. You guys are rock stars. Um, okay. Uh, so next, we're going to talk about tags. Uh, these are a feature that I added. Um, if you're familiar with Erlong, you probably know tags. Um, they appear a lot, you know, and especially once you use uh, like overloaded functions, they become useful. Uh, they're called, excuse me, and they're called atoms uh, in Erlong. Um, and so with kind of the way that Erlong sidesteps, you know, or I should say in its original incarnation, you know, kind of it's becoming, you know, especially through Elixir, they're introducing more type stuff uh, into it. But in classical Erlong, a lot of the stuff that you do is statically typed since Erlong is like radically untyped, or you'd say very, very, very late typed. Um, you do stuff when overloading that you would do with types, you use tags to do that instead. I think they're pretty neat. They don't make a lot of sense in the language right now, but I think that there are subsequent features that I'd want to introduce. It would make great use of them, especially nominalisms, um, you know, separate from like you have labels and algebraic data types, but I kind of wanted something separate from that that you could use in function positions. And so this is an example of using that. Um, it doesn't do a lot here. It basically just echoes back out the number uh, as long as, you know, it's, it's been, you know, specified correctly, this actually is an arm that would never get executed. Uh, this is pretty much, you know, exhaustive as it is. And all it's going to do is just echo, echo back the X, but I just kind of with this, you know, with the, with the place where system R, the base bottom dialect is right now, tags don't make a lot of sense, but I think they're pretty neat. And uh, I, I use this, this was like my babby steps, kind of my first modification of the language, uh, that I did as a modification to the Base language instead of an ex, uh, um, extension before I could, you know, implement the kit that I wanted to do a small change. So this was kind of part of that progression. Um, and so I hope that there'll be future dialects that'll actually be able to leverage tags to do interesting things, like especially, it's like a, I said, go ahead. Just out, of just out of curiosity. So it, it's not complaining when it's, when you do case X of X comma at foo. So is it, I, I'm just, I'm just noticing that. So you couldn't, if you had like, case y of true then return y then it wouldn't does it like does it forget about what x is or does x mask does the second instance of x mask the case instance of x or is it Ooh, you're right. is, yeah, yeah, yeah. or do you lose it's, the scope of that variable when you go into that yeah so if, so if you change it to that that's totally fine so, but so, so i can answer it for you it shadows it because of alpha conversion and the de bruyne indexes that's what okay. it does. So, so it shadows it. Okay. So it's, it's not, yeah. okay. So it's not like, it's not like the, the, the variable gets forgotten about it. It, it literally is shadowing it. Okay. Yeah. Because I mean, it all kind of, you have to see kind of the mechanics of it. Like, like I said, like this thing is, is like really, it's like a giant clockwork machine. And that's, what's really interesting about Lambda Calculus is like, it's at this level where you can actually see the individual pieces moving. And, and that's an example of like where you can kind of, you can watch 
stuff flow into and out of the De Bruyne indexes and kind of how uh, with the generated terms, they just reference numbers instead of actual values or variables by name. And so. So if you put, stuff. if you had like case X of parentheses, X comma at foo goes to X. And then you had the second line was underscore goes to X. Then. Yeah. They'd return different things. They'd return different also, things because. Yeah. In that first branch, you okay. In the first branch, the X would shadow the previous X, but the second branch is sort of a higher scope, so it wouldn't. Um, okay, just trying to Let's see what I complain about. Sorry, get a sense. Here we go. Okay, Ooh. wasn't happy about it, doesn't consider it. Oh, okay, I know. Yeah, there we go. Sorry, I just wanted to, you know, this is exhaustive on its own. It should be, oh no. Oh, look at that, see, it's complaining it's not exhaustive, so that's why I had it in there, funny. I've already been through this, obviously. Um, yeah, fun times. So that's probably like a little, I, sh I should add that to the rough edges, because I consider, I mean, this first pattern with the tag, it's, I consider this exhaustive, like this is equivalent to, like really because this is just a, an atom value, this can actually be eliminated. You can't do anything with this. And so it's really just the binding and yeah, um, that's actually the thing I wanna do. I'm gonna, I'm gonna note that down for later. Okay, uh, and then, so from here, we wanna move on to the very last uh, one, and this is byte literals. So uh, this is um, pretty straightforward. It's just uh, square brackets uh, where you can, and pass in a comma delimited list of zero through 255. Um, and you know, there it is, there's your byte literals. And um, this is funny, I actually have a more complex example uh, that, you know, had a pretty, a pretty long byte string, but I just truncated it for this. And uh, I don't know if anybody has the ASCII table memorized, but I'll, I'll spare you guys from having to uh, do that. But this is just get because the, uh, the, the, the ASCII string was like a, uh, it was an HTTP request that I have encoded um, as a byte string or byte literal. And so this is something that I wanted to add. Originally I wanted to do, I was gonna do floats and uh, maybe even decimals as well, but I realized that just with the natural numbers and bytes, uh, you could just do it as higher representations and uh, it would make a lot more sense to do that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna just kind of set that aside and, and leave those for uh, for dialects or, you know, some kind of more more uh, complex. The word of Indians. Yep. All right, so we're back uh, to slideshow land, and we're into part three. Uh, really quick, we will run through uh, kind of what's upcoming for this system, and of course, taking more of your questions. Uh, so, with this, um, what's in the green is kind of what we have, and what I, I showed and talked about. Oh, you know what? There's one last thing I did want to actually show that I did, which is the dialect system. Um, so I have specs for the dialects for type alias. This is the one that I have kind of mostly implemented. And so really what this is, is there's just a new type keyword and it behaves a lot like let, uh, like let polymorphism, but we have a different namespace that starts with a, a dollar sign and uppercase. And then it lets you just declare and set aside a type. And then it applies within the scope. And so all this is, is uh, the generalized type constructor applied to type polymorphism. This is an example of with this dialect in place and there's some holes in it. I broke it actually trying, I wanted to, because um, the uh, that unfold part two was so ugly, I actually wanted to do it in type alias dialect. And I found some places where it breaks down uh, because since I've written this, you know, this dialect, I've actually learned a lot more about the language and kind of more advanced features. And so I'm gonna come back to this stuff. Um, but this basically just does, you know, like I said, type constructors and it allows you to declare, set it aside. You can see here we're doing, you know, type application. So this is like a full type, you know, and we're, you know, fully qualifying it. Uh, this is kind of when, what's novel about that as well is that type abstraction is lifted to that type declaration level instead of only happening within functions. So it's like, you know, the way you can declare uh, generic types in many languages is the same thing there. So that's 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 a really kind of a uh, notable thing. Uh, the dialects themselves, it's um, it's it, it's it's pretty wild. Uh, I want to, I'll probably talk a little bit more about it in a bit. Um, what I want to do there, but that's some changes. But um, you could just say from above, you know, any dialect you can build up towards you 
uh, a place where you have a sufficiently advanced dialect, say that does things like effect handlers or any kind of special system that you want to be able to model, that you would just write a language and its parser and lexer would just spit out tokens and terms in that higher dialect. And so, me, you know, the idea is that you can build this up to, and the ceiling of it is right below an actual industrial programming language that can then be translated down, but still be really powerful. Um, I think it, it provides a common substrate. It's a, it's another IR that, um, you know, the idea kind of the, the promise of the .NET uh, IL bytecodes, um, you know, the, 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 those are lower level. This is existing at a higher level. And also I think it provides kind of the, um, the, the, the right level of abstraction to kind of have like a function-based ecosystem in modules uh, instead of, you know, and then be able to string those together into a whole program at compilation time. Um, and, but that's stuff that's kind of outside the scope of system art itself. And then building down below the base dialect uh, or the bottom dialect, you can either evaluate this or you can do, you know, you can move it towards lower representations. Um, if you wanted to take system R uh, bottom dialect in terms, and you wanted to, instead of evaluating it, say you wanted to turn it into WASM, or you wanted to turn it into Rust, you know, lexical Rust code, or you wanted to turn it into, you know, Rust bytecodes or LLVM IR or, you know, uh, .NET IL, whatever. Um, you need to kind of have a better handle on language, on the memory, or you have to kind of add a bunch of functionality. And for me, the easiest way to do that is to implement a linear, a linear uh, Lambda calculus dialect below uh, the base dialect. And so the idea is that uh, the, the bottom dialect is kind of ignorant of memory and it translates down. And in the process you do um, with linear algebra, you, you're able to look at a value and you're able to say, was this thing used multiple times? Was it passed to another function? You know, if your values allow mutation, you would say, was this thing mutated and how? And so you get, you know, things like escape analysis and kind of what happens in Rust with the uh, affine types uh, which is a kind of limited subset of linear types, you're getting all of that. And then with that information on hand, you can then make pretty good assumptions uh, about what kind of bytecodes you want to generate, especially if you have kind of a more you know, explicit manual memory system, which is pretty cool. Um, and this is one th another thing I'm going to talk about here. Uh, so for, I guess, really quick, um, so the idea is with the question marks on the bottom, you know, that could be WASM, anything else. Um, the linear, everything in yellow obviously doesn't exist. Uh, the linear uh, system R is something that I think would be really cool. Um, the dialect system as it exists, it's for translating, you know, dialects of one kind to another. The bottom dialect is itself a dialect, which means I could write a translator for it into a linear system. And so you could know how to, if you have valid system R, you can generate valid linear, you know, whatever. And so um, the idea is that just, you know, you get the annotations, instead of enforcing a linear type system, you just do all the linear checking, annotate all the types and values so you can make that, those decisions about lower representation. Any questions? Okay, one more slide, we're almost there. Um, okay. this is a big question. No, I can hold to the end. Okay. I, I thought it, that was right. the end of the talk. Uh, really quick, so for future enhancements, um, you know, like this is with the kind of caveat that, you know, I mean, I'm an independent contractor, so, you know, I'm, I'm working uh, on, you know, a project, uh, you know, basically to, to earn money to support myself. I do this in my spare time. Um, this isn't anything I'm getting paid for. So, you know, I mean, I'm, you know, I do this at the pace that I can. Uh, I want to overhaul the dialect system. Um, I didn't really show it, but... Uh, the um it's pretty hairy uh in terms of like what it takes this is the api so this is like these are all little points in the lex and the parser pattern matching all these different parts of the compilation process where i knew you know hey for implementing some extension this is a a, a hook in point that i needed uh, i realized that i kind of went about this the wrong way and i need to just turn it upside down uh there really should be just a per a phase event entry point and you know any point within where I might want extensible functionality within the base, you know, parsing, lexing, and type check system, I should just call into those and lift an event uh, by basically compilation phase, and then kind of push all that complexity into individual dialects. Um, at this point, the type alias dialect weighs in at about 800 lines with everything that you need just to add that type aliasing feature. I'm hoping by pushing that complexity, and I can actually reorganize it and bring it down. Of course, I want to implement more dialects, 
Um, you know, there's a bunch of things that I want. When I talk about art funds, that means what the art means is uh, arguments, uh, return type, and type abstraction. So the, 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 those are things that all happen right now in system F languages, but it, you'll, or in system R, but you'll notice that the functions don't ever specify return type. And that's something that's only ever figured out and mattered if you end up passing that function in uh, arrow in, in, as, a, as a parameter and it goes through an arrow check, you know? And so then the type system can validate you know, what the return type is and that the return types are consistent. Otherwise, it just actually doesn't really, you know, matter. Um, and so I want to kind of uh, add, in addition to simplification, I also said I have this up here, actually, a term occlusion. And that would be the idea that uh, you could set a extension up so that if specific non-extended terms occurred, or even specific kind of extended terms from some lower dialect that's above the bottom dialect occur that you're aware of in your dialect, um, you can basically block those from being lexed, parsed, or type checked, and you can substitute them with something else, or you can just cause a fail. And in that way, you could say, yeah, uh, no more Lambda function declarations. They all need to follow this format that exists in my new dialect. Um, so I like the uh, term occlusion is what I'm calling that, and that's something that I need to add so that I can basically block out the janky features of system R and replace them with newer versions that kind of are more robust and, you know, easier to make sense of. Uh, I like, um, like I mentioned, function overloading and Erlong and tags. I really like those kind of sums. Of, they're, they're, they're like some types of function, basically. And then at invocation time, you figure out which of the sums that actually you're, the path you're going through. If you take function bodies out of that, then you actually, just basically have what are type classes or uh, interfaces in other languages. You just have you know a series of declarations that are overloaded. So I think that that's a really interesting way to introduce nominalism. Um, if you're familiar, you know, or, you know, really, really deep uh, um, into uh, functional programming, you know that there's this split between structural typing and nominal typing. And so right now, uh, system R is mostly nominal. Uh, this would be a way to introduce more, or excuse me, more most mostly structural. This would be a way to introduce more nominalisms, uh, effects, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, like I mentioned, rough edges that I want to clean up. I want to do a proper compilation type pipeline. I've started on this, but it's a separate project. I'm kind of letting that gestate and think about it. And then, of course, I want to add that linear system R. Uh, I would recommend reading the Perseus paper. Uh, that's It's by some of the same authors that I showed in that quote earlier. It's related to COCA, uh, an effect-based language. But they have a really slick uh, memory algorithm that uses basically linear algebra to do analysis on the code and make decisions about whether things are copied. And you can it does a bunch of slick stuff to kind of uh, do the minimal number of uh, allocations necessary, and it's there's no garbage collection, even though the language you know doesn't have you know strict memory or anything like that. And it's pretty sweet, and so I'm hoping to be able to do all that and more. Um, thank you everybody uh, for coming out. I know it's a pretty dense topic, and I hope that this was uh, enriching for everybody. Um, your questions? Why is it called System R? Uh, because it's adopted from System F, and uh, R is for Rust, but also like I have an idea for other follow on projects that kind of are, you know, related uh, sound wise. And so it's just kind of tied into that, you know, that's how I named it. Cool. Hey, I had a, I had a question. Um, sure. So there was, there was a part in your code where you had like all these like type declarations in the middle of the cons expression, right? Uh, is that because you're not getting like a, a type Hindley Milner style type inference, or is that, is that something that's possible that you could add to the language that would, would help with some of that or. Um, yeah, no, it's, so you're talking about like some of the stuff in here. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah, that's a part of it. I think that really what it is, is it's, um, I think that uh, labels basically mm -hmm. for types don't really propagate down. And so that's kind of something that probably like a uh, like a um, a more fully fleshed out type aliasing system, you know, you would store it, you know, in you oh, know, I and see. then maybe you'd be able to dive into variants and there'd be like namespacing that way. Um, but like really, yeah, this is I mean, you know, the point about kind of like Henley Milner is weird because like three fourths of Henley Milner is just what is in the system F type check system. And it, it, it's yeah. it's it's reapplied for basically reasoning kind of, you know, both kind of it like a, in a lexical sense and also like in developer experiences, but, but like, it, you know, 
And so a lot of that is here, but you're definitely right that there are rough edges in the language, but also, I mean, this isn't, you know, my ultimate goal is that this isn't a day-to-day -day language, but it's a substrate that is mostly assembled at compile time and, um, you know, before being translated into something else, but like, you know, it, it'll be a lingua franca for a bunch of different systems, I'm hoping, a bunch of different languages. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Let's see, any, any other questions, comments? Yeah, I can see. Let me stop the recording. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you very much. Stop recording.